type implementations to cloud-based architectures. Um, that is driving the upgrade paths for all these ERPs, um, like anything else that's, that's going on in the world. Everything's, everything's migrating to cloud. Um, common ERP scenario, again, merger integrations, carve-outs. I deal with this all the time. Um, I've got, I'm working with a client right now, two different companies. One of them is on JDE, JD Edwards. One of them is on SAP. We're moving everybody to SAP. Um, so those are, you know, typical scenarios you might have. The other one, I, I just dealt, did one in last fall where we were doing a carve out from another company and we had to stand up a new ERP package. So we, we used, implemented a, a cloud version of NetSuite um, because it's a mid-sized company and, and that's a good application to use for a mid-sized company. Um, consolidations, you're collapsing them like we're doing with the, the project I'm on right now. Um, and then the movement to cloud. I, again, I can't overstate how everything is going to cloud, including ERP. Um, a lot of times people, organizations in terms of optimization, in terms of IT strategy, they're, they're shedding data centers, shedding infrastructure, getting everything to cloud-based providers. Um, you know, they want to take advantage of the, the cybersecurity that's available in cloud-based cloud -based solutions. I mean, one of the, the things people talk about as well is it's secure in the cloud. And every time they've had data breaches, they've been largely companies that manage their own data centers. I mean, you can't, you can't spend billions and billions of dollars like Microsoft does. Um, so, you know, the, 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 trend, the transition and trend to the cloud is something that's across all of technology and all of IT and ERP includes that as well. Let's talk about the history of where we are today. Um, this whole thing started out in the 60s, um, mostly with inventory management and controls. In the 70s, MRP came in, materials requirement and planning. So you had inventory, then you have the um, materials requirements. 80s went into uh, manufacturing requirements. So if you think about it, it's all built based on supply chain initially. 1990s, enterprise resource management. That's when the whole manufacturing and inventory management side of this came in, plus sales and sales and distribution, um, plus products like product lifecycle management. Um, and also financial management. So if you think about it, you had your, your customer facing side, you ordered a cash side, um, the material, the MRP side, which had to do with materials requirements, manufacturing and inventory control. I will tell you when I was doing ERP work in the nineties, the biggest driver we had was Y2K. Okay. Because it was, it was an easy way to, to complement and to solve whatever systems problems you had or perceived that you had for Y2K based issues. Um, so, I mean, we used to, we implemented, you know, it was like taking orders at that time. It was, if, you would, if there was ever a golden age of being a consultant, that was it. Um, because, you know, we would just implement Y2K with the expect, implement ERP with the expectation um, that it would be, um, you know, that would, that, would, that would solve your Y2K issues. 2000, you're getting the whole, the whole web functionalities through internet. Um, that's the portal-based solutions that you're seeing some elements of mobile devices. And then, you know, where we are today is cloud-based. It's all about getting everything on the cloud. Um, in terms of mobile devices and integration through cloud-based architectures um, and using that to, to, to drive organizations. And I'll talk about, you know, some of the guiding principles of architecture. And this is, again, something I see with every client I deal with. I mean, we, I, you know, I, I probably don't, you know, I deal with lots of clients every year and it's, and they're all basically saying the same thing. So it's, it's an interesting, um, the emphasis on cloud, configuration, agility, speed to market, you know, those are all drivers that, um, you know, cross everything as far as, um, as far as um, IT is concerned. SAP, um, I mean, I've, I've, I've started my, my time with SAP was when I started my career working with ERP packages. I've branched, branched out, but, you know, this is like this roadmap for the product really corresponds quite well to the historical roadmap that we talked about before. You know, they went from, you know, mainframe R2 based solutions, you know, and then in the early nineties, they had the client server based R3, which was an R, which was the on-prem, on-prem version of it. Three tier architecture, you had a database server, an application server and a, and a desktop UI. Um, so that was all, you know, that's what people were implementing in the nineties. Again, this is the Y2K period. Um, 2000, it was all web-based, um, World Wide Web. Um, you know, that's when they held the whole e-commerce and, and e-dot and, um, you know, hold the whole e-commerce trend was at that point. Um, 19, 2004, the SOA, service-oriented architecture, started coming in. And then they started moving towards HANA, um, which was the in-memory computer, 
computing, and there's there's two versions of S of HANA S4 HANA, and they've also got a C4 product which is used for CRM, um, which really talked about you know let's 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 um, you know get to this integrated business piece. You know, then the data warehouse BW came into the picture. Um, again, the importance of data and analytics and cloud computing, that nexus, I mean, this that's where this comes in. Um, and then 2003, you know, the SAP business by HANA, business objects and things of that sort for reporting. And then they had more finance. And then, you know, where we are today is it's cloud-based HANA. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of the SAP product roadmap, one of the major um, drivers of that is the fact that, um, you know, 2027 now, SAP is going to stop supporting ECC 6 implementations, which are, you know, the on-prem solutions. So they're actually forcing everybody to go to cloud. Um, and you're seeing that across the board. Um, so um, so that's that's a major trend here, and that's a major driver in the ERP space. If you're an ERP practitioner, you know, understanding cloud technology, how to migrate to cloud technology, the fact is that vendors are pushing you to cloud. Um, I mean, that's definitely a good opportunity for, um, you know, skill sets to acquire because, you know, they're going to be in demand going forward. And I have some information from Gartner later on. We can talk about that. Okay. First pause. Questions? Comments? Just unmute. If anyone has any questions? So John, quick question. So are we going to talk about the roadmap in after cloud ERP? What is next? Um, we're going to talk about what's going on for terms of the in terms of the product roadmap you're talking about. Yep. We're going to talk about what the different products are in the marketplace and what the pros and cons are of the different brand of the different um, solutions. Um, sure. We'll talk about some of the trends. We'll talk about those things. Um, but yeah, we, we can touch on some of that um, in terms of like the SAP roadmap. I mean, we, I mean, we can talk about that, but it's really, you know, broad-based ERP. How do you decide which one to use at different points in time? What are the benefits and strengths of each one and when to implement? Yep. Yeah. Anything will help there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, John, one question is, uh, we had implemented a project tracking and planning tool from SAP. Mm -hmm. uh, is it still on or is there anything uh, you would be able to throw light on the are you talking like solution manager is that what you're talking about no for project management planning and the tracking and the, then integrating it with the resources uh, a timeline capturing and things like that so it's like an mpp but it i mean it is not an mpp uh, microsoft project plan tool but it is like that similar to that so we had implemented uh, c projects uh, that was the name uh, from sap that time okay um I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, no problem. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's keep. Let me keep going here. Do we want to go right to? Um, do we want to talk about different software packages? It seems like there's a lot of interest in that. I was going to cover that towards the end, but we could we could go to that right now if we wanted to. Why don't we do that? Sure. It seems like I've had multiple questions on that subject, and I always try to change, be, go with the flow on these things. So um, why don't we jump to that part, and then we'll come back to the other part, because I think it flows pretty well here. OK. Let's talk about ERP systems. Um, I mean, one of the, the challenges I see, I, I deal with all the time, is that you know, there's which application should we use, and and you know, th there are specialty ones that are for spe that are industry specific, but generally the ones that I deal with most of the time, um, Sage, um, Oracle NetSuite, Dynamics 365, Oracle EBS eBusiness Suite, and, and then Hana. As, I mean, and, and then um, SAP. Oops, let's have it. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the strengths of, of all these, um, you know, medium process support, I think the processes are, are very good on all of these. And because, I mean, I mean, and I'll tell you, part of, part of what I do with, with my job is that we, we recommend technologies because, you know, the client will ask us, you know, which of these packages should we use based on our, based on our particular, our, our particular environment. And this is kind of how we, um, you know, how we, we go about doing that. 
Um, so, you know, the medium process, process support, they're all, they're all good. Um, in terms of complex processes support, like banking and financial records, multi-country, multi-regulatory financial consolidations, inter-entity inter invoicing. Um, to be honest with you, if you need it, if for international, if you've got an international business requirement, look at Oracle, look at HANA. Um, I mean, I usually typically, if it's a domestic client, mid-sized, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of NetSuite. I'm a big fan of Dynamics. Um, and, but if I'm dealing with multi-currency or international type issues, um, EBS or, or HANA, I would go with either, either one of those. Um, in terms of making a decision on these, um, I'm, I'm, I'm given I'm an old SAP guy. I'm definitely, I tend to lean this way um, just because, you know, they're constantly innovating. Um, the digital transformation is core to what SAP is doing at this point. Um, so I, I'm, and they've also got the whole integration with um, their analytics engines and business objects. So if you, in terms of like ability to support analytics solutions, I mean, the SAP piece of this is, is good. Ease of implementation. Okay. And migration. Uh, that's where something like NetSuite and um, Sage have, a, have an advantage there. And then if you look at some of these other ones like EBS or, or, or HANA, those can be kind of hard. I mean, let me, let me just give you some a war story there. We, we, my client last in 2019, we implemented NetSuite. We started in June and went live in October. Okay, this was a Greenfield implementation. So and we, we actually did a vendor selection, software selection, and stood up a team in three weeks from the beginning of the end. So the beginning of June, we showed up, we picked a package, we selected, we, we signed up a systems integrator. We started the project at the end of June, July, August, September. Three months later, we went live with NetSuite. Um, the cost was around, for, for integration services, about 350 k um, licensing was about I forget what the number is, but it, but those are there's a there's a discount on three year um, on three year subscriptions. But NetSuite was very simple and easy to implement. Um, Dynamics is good too. Um, the the advantage of Dynamics, of course, is that it's integrated with Office 365. Um, so you know the, the Microsoft suite is very integrated. Um, it's built on the on the common data platform, so you could use things like Power BI, for example. Um, to drive reporting and organizational reporting and analytics, and Power BI is really easy to use. Um, again, for these, Oracle EBS and, and HANA, um, those are for, you know, they take about 12 to, eight, 12, 12 to 18 months to put in. Um, it's more complex, but if you're doing international type work, again, you know, these are the, these are the ones you'd want to look at. Um, in terms of complexity of manufacturing, for example, if you're dealing with heavy manufacturing, these would be more the types of applications you would use. Um, in terms of migration, you know, in terms of how um, ease of implementation here, you know, I think, I think, um, you know, again, I think Dynamics is pretty easy here. In terms of rapid implementations, you know, as I was saying, the NetSuite piece is pretty quick. Um, so it's very, very easy to implement. These are a little harder. I think personally, my experience is that EBS is, is more complex. Um, there's, there, if you notice on this, I did not put JD Edwards in there. Um, Oracle JDE is, is a, common platform. Um, the reason for that is only time I've dealt with JDE is when I'm taking it out. Um, I do not have an example of implementation of JDE, but I have lots of examples of people getting rid of JDE and moving to one of these other platforms. So it's for that reason alone, we generally don't, I, you know, just generally don't consider it. Um, maintenance and upgrades. These are pretty easy. Um, the, what, the way they work is to get a note from every, every month comes in from the vendor. Uh, it's a SaaS-based solution. Software is a service-based solution. So, you know, that, that's all supported by the provider. If it's a software as a service um, cloud-based solution. Um, upgrades can be harder with um, SAP um, until you get to the cloud. So, again, I, again, this is another one of these where cloud-based architectures and solutions are, are pretty important. Ease of use. They're all pretty easy. I would always argue that SAP is a little harder because the screens are less intuitive. Um, but I've, I've always found big NetSuite and, and Dynamics are pretty easy to use. In terms of scalability and performance, all cloud-based. Uh, they're all they're all scalable across their different enterprises. Um, I, I think you know if you think about the benefits, this has you know the integration with O365, um, so you can get on the you're on the Azure stack, cloud-based Azure stack. So that's a big plus there from a data and analytics piece. Plus, you can use security. You get the authentication through Active Directory of Office 365. So that's another 
little plus there, but pretty much everyone uses O365 and there's connectors from these applications through O365 for, for AD, for Active Directory authentication. Integration, again, NetSuite's easy to, uh, easy to integrate. We, when, we did, when we did this project last summer, uh, we integrated it with Concur, we integrated it with uh, multiple banks so we could have ease of payment. Um, we integrated it with um, some um, POEs so we could do HR-based applications, HR things. We integrated it with um, um, travel systems as well. Um, so we were able to, you know, this was really easy. There's standard out-of-the-box connectors that are pretty, pretty well established. Um, SAP does the same thing. Um, in terms of the, the, the ease of the, the, the less, they're less sophisticated with the dynamic side of it than they are with NetSuite, for example. Um, cost of implementation and maintenance. Okay, these are a lot more expensive. If you go with a cloud-based solution, either Oracle or HANA, the way those work is it's a three-year contract and it's not linear because there's a larger upfront payment um, for the cloud provider. So they're, you know, for them to do the, to do the application management for you. Um, NetSuite is pretty consistent. They're based on pure licenses. So it's how many seats do you have? This is the number of, this is what the cost is. Um, and then for analytics, um, you know, the ability to integrate with analytics, I think is pretty, pretty significant. It's important. Um, I think in terms of what the solutions are, you've got the whole business objects piece on the HANA side. We were talking about product roadmap. Um, they're spending a lot of money on, on you know, SAP is spending a lot of money in terms of analytics and the ability to, um, you know, get driving customer experience and trend analysis and all that. Um, in terms of dynamics, that's also, again, hooked into the Microsoft space. So you've got all the, all the services that are available in Azure for cloud-based, as a cloud service available to help you there. Um, NetSuite is also pretty good. Um, I mean, my, my view on this is if you're a mid-sized company, I mean, I, I'm a big NetSuite fan. It's easy to put in, very intuitive. The licensing is very simple. Um, it's just based on seats, uh, and they, they do a good job from a, from a maintenance perspective. Any questions on this? So, I have a question. How would you rate yeah. them on customizations? Okay, you're talking custom customization or configuration? Custom. Customization. Okay. The, most of these, the ones I deal with are, are cloud-based solutions. In terms of customizing an application, you don't, you, I recommend you never customize an application because when you do that, it damages the, the upgradability of the solution. Uh, if it's an on-prem version of it, you, you're off the upgrade path. It invalidates your warranty. Um, Cloud-based, um, you really can't. What you need to do is if you want to use like a user X or, or some of those and, and interface with a, a, a some type of a third party, um, I mean, you can do that in terms of, you know, what I've seen, I mean, I have, I'm currently working with um, some SAP stuff that, that, that integrates with a um, homegrown database between salesforce.com and, and SAP. So you can do it, but it, it all has to, it's all based upon the, uh, you know, the ability to interface with other applications. Um, I know, I know you can do it with SAP. I've, I've dealt with that. Um, NetSuite, I mean, I've tried to stay with, um, you know, standard configuration, standard integrations as much as possible. Um, the other way to do that is, you know, the whole idea of a data lake. I don't know if everyone, does everyone know what a data lake is? I do. Okay. Let me, let me, let me just go jump on data lakes. And I, and this is an important concept because if you want to talk about ERP integration, the whole concept of a data lake is very important. What a data lake architecture is, it means that all the data that's sent from a system rather than going to a, another system in a point-to-point -point based architecture actually goes to a data lake which is um, like it usually so you push into this giant cloud record all the data comes in there and then it's actually sent out from the data lake to the other system so basically this lake acts as a gigantic clearinghouse for all your data this is a very important concept if, if you talk about customers and what clients are doing and what people are doing right now analytics, artificial intelligence, how do we do things like, um, you know, industry 4.0, all of that stuff consumes massive amounts of data. And by using an architecture that allows all the data to be aggregated and also, and also enhanced, I mean, so a lot of times, what, one customer I'm dealing with, the people in New York from last summer, you know, they built a data lake-based architecture. All the data is consolidated into this data lake. Then they're buying stuff 
data from other providers, mashing it up, and then they're using that as a mechanism for enabling new businesses and new, new opportunities. I mean, data can be used as a huge value. It's a huge weapon as a, um, you know, new businesses, new transactions, new offerings in the marketplace. So, I mean, that, that's, that is tremendously important in terms of how to integrate. And I think, you know, when you're building an ERP, um, definitely you want to use something like this as a forward position foundation for, you know, what you're doing from a data perspective in terms of data strategy. Um, I mean, I, I, do, I did a project about a year and a half ago with um, Gulfstream, okay? And I was talking to the guy who's in charge of flight safety, who does flight safety for these things. And, and he had this comment that you hear all the time, and I hear this basically the same comment. I have a lot of data, but not a lot of knowledge, okay? And, and understanding the value of data and what you can do with it is that's, that's major trends. That's what everybody's doing, especially with automation, machine learning, all of that. I mean, that's, that's all being used right now to gain insights from it. Um, I read a data, I read something in a McKinsey study that said, in the last two years, we have generated more data than we have in the last 20 years before that. I mean, so that, that is a <clears throat> massive trend within the, within the world right now in, in terms of technology. But that's the other way to do integration. So I would never customize my code. What I would do is have use either some type of a bolt-on that, that I would go out and export the data to a bolt-on or use a data lake type structure as a, as a clearinghouse for the overall data. This is Lillian. I have a quick question. The the idea around the data yeah. is it is it that you're able to report out of all of the elements that go into that data lake? Well, you can report out of it, but more importantly, you can do an analysis against it. Um, I mean, let me give you my example at Gulfstream. They collect the flight data person. They collect all these data points from from like I forget. It's like eighty or hundred different points on an airplane. So they can say, if we're flying and we're going, we're making this turn, this is what the stress is on this part. And then they can take that data and you can run analysis against that and get all kinds of insights in terms of, okay, well, okay, this is where we're having a performance problem at this particular point in time. And therefore, we need to change the, pro the manufacturing, um, how we're making a particular part. So it can be used for insights. It can be used, that's like machine, and for like machine learning, what they call like digital workforce is what they talk about today. You know, for basic clerical type tasks, you know, you can have, you can use machine learning to actually execute those things. And then your staff can go work on things that are more value added. You know, they can actually work on improving the customer experience and all of this, you know, fits into how, you know, IT organizations are, are being defined now. It's all, you know, forward leaning, focus on the customer, focus on the business. And, you know, in terms of things that can be, are repetitive processes and things, you know, a lot of that can be automated using machine learning, using a data lake. Thank you. Any other questions on this? Yeah, I think a <clears throat> quick question, you know, with uh, containerized microservices, uh, cloud-based yeah. architecture, you know, with monolith SAP old style. So, uh, do you have more slides on the cloud roadmap and uh, microservices container roadmap? You know, when to pick what? Any experience uh, guidance you have for microservices and which to pick? Yeah, um, we do. Um, I I I don't have it on the top of my head, but um, yes, we in terms of Cloud service. You're, you're talking about the the um, the, the old, whether to use AWS or whether to use Azure and what the services are and what the portfolio is and all that. Yeah. First question is when you saw saw the ease of integration, right? You know, mm -hmm. of which uh, you recommend the cloud SAP SAP Cloudfire platform is a better pick than the. Oh yeah. That is one thing. The second. Uh, Instead of building a big monolith, big uh, maybe uh, for uh, payment for finance, instead of building using the SAP finance module, why not build it with containerized microservices from scratch, faster integration? You know why, and I, and I'll and I'll tell you why. And I think I mean you get those questions a lot because people are like, well, I don't want to use I don't want to use ERP. I want to use containerized and and segmented piece and you know decentralized architectures. The, the reason is is because a company shouldn't be focused on 
basically non-value added, non-customer facing generic type functions. They should be the, the efforts of your IT organization and the efforts of your architecture and your architects should be focused on how can I use my use technology to drive my business. Something like finance, to be honest with you, I would use SAP because frankly they have they figured this out. They've done this thousands of times across the globe. It's cloud-based. I can integrate with it, I can pull the data from it. But there's really nothing there from an innovation perspective that's going to help me out. If I need to have innovation from financial data, I'm going to put that in the data lake and I'm going to get it out of there. And, and the thing is, if you want to, if you want to talk about the real, the, the benefits of ERP, it's a foundation and we're, we can talk about digital transformation and we can talk about data and all, but it's a wonderful foundation for a digital architecture. It really is. And, you know, I've, I've got some stuff in here. We can talk about like industry 4.0 and digital transformation and all. But I mean, in terms of like for common practices and common processes, it's an excellent foundation. Yeah. And the, the negative, the cons of that is, you know, SAP, you know, the implementation timeline and the expenditure you have to do to start up the project. That's, well, you know. It's, oh, I agree. But I mean, first of all, you don't, you don't do a lot of greenfield SAP. I mean, I, I rarely see people. The only time I do greenfield SAP is if I've, if I've got to do a, a carve out type situation, a merger integration or carve out scenario. They're standing up a new company. It's a greenfield architecture. They're global in nature. Um, so that's the kind of case where you do a greenfield SAP. But most of them are, you know, legacy. A lot of them are upgrades and basically like legacy um, decisions from that were, it's, it's dealing with decisions that were made like in the 90s, for example. You know, a lot of them are on ECC6 because they implemented it in 1998 to solve Y2K. Now we, we own this thing. You know, we've got all the data in there. The tremendous institutional investment. Let's push it off to the cloud, you know. And I think that's that's what's going. You know, that that a lot of it, the decision there too, just because yeah. there's all that institutional knowledge that's that's acquired it. Yep. And uh, one point is how flexible is your design? You know, how fast you can change to agile, right? <laughs> well, that's the whole thing. If we modern architecture, agility, scalability flexibility, configuration. I mean, that's every client I talk to, that's, that's, that's what they're driving towards, you know, speed to market. How fast can I do it? I mean, here's, um, here's the magic quadrant. I mean, in terms of where, where we are from, um, what Gartness is, um, this is interesting. This was the data I was, I was talking about earlier in 2021. Um, Okay, everyone's going to public cloud. By 2021, 70% of all new mid-market cloud ERP projects will be public cloud. And this is the one. By 2021, 65% of systems integrators and resellers will be unable to train their teams in the product. Okay, that, so from an opportunity perspective, you know, understanding and, and being knowledgeable about cloud, cloud migration, that's, that's something that's going to happen. And, and there's actually another little data point here that I wanted to talk about also, but um, so, I mean, from Gardner's, from Gardner's perspective, I mean, the data backs up that everybody's going to cloud. And if you, and if you have skills that allow you to ha help that out, it's going to be something that's going to be useful. Um, plus the licensing, all these on-prem solutions. I mean, the, the, there's going to have to be migrations there. So it's, there's going to be, there's definitely going to be a market out there for people to provide those services. The other one that's kind of interesting, and I'm, I'm going to jump around here a little bit, but I will come back here, was we've had a lot of common questions about, you know, what does COVID-19 mean to us? Frankly, we, we've, we've come up with like a vision of, you know, what are the impacts on this? You know, and this is pretty much going around and it's like, well, what are the, you know, what do we think is going to be the new normal post COVID? And it's like, well, what about volatility of earnings? You know, we're, we're not sure what, what the impact is on customer behavior. Focus on customer safety. You know, that's obviously something, another output of what's going on with COVID. But this is the third third one: massive adoption of social, mobile analytics and cloud solutions. Um, everything's going remote. The idea of brick and mortar is is, is going to be gone. Um, in terms of the the cloud, I mean, we're getting tremendous demand at this point to, you know, let's get to the cloud. Let's do mobile solutions. Let's do analytics solutions. Let's do cloud solutions, and really understanding how all this works. So I think from a trend perspective, um, and I can tell you in my business right now, um, you think you know FTI, we do a lot of bankruptcies, right? Sure, we've got a lot of business to do in that. We're also getting transformation and restructuring stuff coming on right now, just because of all the disruption that's going on as a result of this COVID-19 thing. 
you know, we talked about national self-reliance. People are going to make sure their, um, you know, their supply chain is focused here in the United States, but also, re and the other one is resilience, you know, making sure we've got redundant supply chain and, and we're not going to have um, any shortfalls or, or problems with that. But, you know, analytics, social, and cloud are, are major drivers here. Um, and then using something like ERP as a foundation, you know, that's, that's you know, pretty important overall in terms of how to do this. Uh, there we go. A, um, you know, example of tier cloud-based solution. Um, we could have something like, you know, it's a small mid-market company. Revenue is about forty million to four hundred million. You know, they do s services, software, uh, not very complex business process that they're doing with. They're not compliant with HIPAA, but they but they are SOCs and, and PCI compliant. About sixty to one hundred users. You know, in terms of, you know, basically this is a classic example of when NetSuite would be go in or something like, um, or, or Stage. You know, six month, four to six month project to take over their financial operation. And this is important for a company this size because frankly, you know, they should be focusing on the customer and innovation. They shouldn't be focusing on finance, right? Um, so, you know, this is, you know, this is a typical profile of the kind of companies we see doing this type of work. Um, in terms of the suites, I mean, I, I hear the major ones, and we can go through these individually. You know, what are the major modules that are out there? I mean, for, for SAP, this is the S4 HANA piece. You know, essentially what you've got is you've got the, the finance module, which includes Concur and Ariba. Um, and these are the major processes, financial planning, accounting and financial close, receivables, cost accounting, cost management, you know, HR, which is success factors. Um, we're and field glass. I mean, we're implementing success factor. We're doing a success factors implementation right now, you know, around payroll, T and E, um, human capital. In terms of procurement, we've got Ariba field glass over here too. Um, so in terms of sourcing and procurement, that's all can be functioned out of here. Manufacturing, uh, major components are out of there. All the supply chain pieces out of it. Extended warehouse management, inventory and basic warehouse product um, production planning. And then if we go on the other side of the house over here, the sales, the customer facing side, you've got the whole order and contract management piece. Um, and then you've got the, what their, um, there's another piece they've got called C4, which is sitting on top of that, which is supposed to compare with, compete with, with, um, with um, salesforce.com. Um, not necessarily as well, but <clears throat> they're trying to um, service cloud and service engagement center, marketing and commerce, asset management, research and development. So these are the, you know, primary modules for S4, HANA. This is the old ECC6 um, architecture for HANA, for SAP, where you've got logistics, accounting, human resources, cross app. These are the basic modules that, that flow out of there. This is, this is all based on client server. This is the three-tier architecture on-prem. We have a database server, application server, and front-end server. This is for... Um, Sage and NetSuite. So for NetSuite modules, um, usually One World is what a lot of people buy, but they have that, a lot of that's financial stuff. But you can get like the project management piece, financials, planning, analytics, customers, logistics. Um, I mean, I was the one I told you about. We did it. We stood this thing up in three months. Um, so it's pretty pretty nice little nice little application. Sage. Uh, again, they've got a lot of the professional services, accounting, marketing, customer service, sales, retail, um, trade, wholesale. And then if you go out here for Dynamics, um, you go to Oprah for, for, for Microsoft. Um, these have got all the different pieces of it here. Um, in terms of the front end, I mean, the big one is the, they have us trying to go against um, Salesforce.com. They're not necessarily as effective as Salesforce, but in terms of their financial management components of it, I'm sorry, the CRM is right here. That's where they're trying to compete with uh, Salesforce. But, you know, the project management, HR, expenses, inventory, you know, these are the major modules for Dynamics. And then for EBS, Oracle eBusiness Suite, um, we've got the other ones where we've got a manufacturing, fulfillment, inventory, BI, reporting, customer service, customer relation management, human capital, Financial asset management and sales and order processing. 
Uh, John, this is Pat Chowdhury. Um, can you yeah. talk a bit about uh, Industry 4.0 and the implications that um, ERP yeah. would have on it? Um, Bill Craddock asked that question. I don't know if he was able to get in on the audio. But. Yeah, sure. Um, let's talk about 4.0. I mean, what, here we go. This section here, what I was hoping to cover was, you know, basically trends, you know, trends for ERP, um, how we're seeing things like, you know, what, what are some of the key business enabling capabilities for customer experience? And it's around, you know, customer experience, digital strategy, analytics, cloud services, and speed to market. Um, let's talk about Industry 4.0 in particular, though we can come back to digital transformation after that. But let's talk about 4.0 because someone's asking the question. Um, you know, what it is, is it's the current trend of automation and data exchange and manu manufacturing technology. It includes, as they call it, cyber physical systems, sensor-based communication, autonomous systems, and Internet of Things, cloud computing, and cognitive computing, like machine learning. Um, you know, they call it the fourth industrial revolution. Where we are here, it's like, you know, if you think about it, we went from 1969 industry 3.0 where we had like computer automation of these processes. <clears throat> and now we're doing, you know, sensor-based um, communication and enabling. So, you know, IoT, Internet of Things, I mean, what is that? That is, you know, gathering data from all the elements that are surrounding you. Um, cloud computing is the ability to bring all things into one repository of data all around the world. And then machine learning is the tool that allows you to draw conclusions and build trends from it. So you can draw in, you can draw inferences and um, pieces on that. Um, so they call it the, you know, the fourth industrial revolution. And um, in terms of the 4.0 practices, using this whole series of digital technologies here across the entire value chain. And, the, and a lot of it is like some of the key technologies, engineering, prototyping, IoT, asset tracking, inspection quality, augmentation reality, social collaboration, workflows, uh, predictive maintenance. Now, the question is, how does ERP fit into this picture? It is a foundation, okay, for things like basic processes that would they'll be in the middle of this, a nexus around this environment. That's how this fits in. Because if you think about it, you know, you're doing manufacturing. If you're doing things like manufacturing, you're doing things like sales, you're doing CRM type applications, customer relationship management, financial management, we get different aspects of finance. Those are things that can be used along with this data to, to drive things that are like machine learning and driving things like um, analytics engines that can allow you to draw insights um, going forward. Um, I have some more stuff on if people are curious about that. Some more stuff on machine learning here. Hold on. Industry four point oh. There it is. And here's the, this is the key, the key. So what you've got here is in terms of, a, you know, partial data, ad hoc decisions, loosely implemented. In a case where you've got a data insight based decisions, where you've got, you know, the right data in context, facts based decisions, and instrument feedback, which is how you're using technology to bring these things together. And the way ERP fits into all this stuff, and here's the maturity model here. And this is kind of how you would stage it from an industry 4.0 perspective, you know, when they talk about overall maturity, it's like, you know, pre-digital plant, then you've got digital silos and a connected plant. Okay, this is like ERP right here. When you bring it into a connected plant, it's an enabler like in a level three to drive industry 4.0. Um, so, 
you know, analytics are semi automated, supply chain, you know, um, at ERP, these are enablers that we have. But then when you get to, when you try to get to level four, level five, predictive plants and adaptive, you know, that's when you can do stuff like product lifecycle management is, is um, fully integrated. You can do quality testing. You've got real times analytics. And then you've got stuff where you can do simulation and all that's with machine learning. What can you learn going forward with, um, with um, adaptive technologies and machine learning and AI? So this can all be, you know, prescriptive in terms of 4.0. So in terms of a way to get and drive your industry 4.0 experience, the foundation to go forward. Hope that answers the question. I think so. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, and we wanted to talk about like, um, we still have 12 minutes. Okay. So in terms of, you know, we talked about architecture and what is, what do we see from an ERP perspective, but, you know, in terms of the foundation of our architecture today, and this is a, this is, in, uh, I do IT due diligences where we, we look at the company's technology and we say, okay, you know, how mature is the organization? And we do a, you know, six to eight week due diligence on a company. <clears throat> you know, this is the measure. Are they, is the architecture flexible, scalable, configurable? Is it agile? Okay, that, that, that's build, that, that means the ability to react quickly, flex quickly, and all that. And, and having a, a well-defined ERP, cloud-based, that's scalable and using that as a foundation allows you to do stuff like industry 4.0, allows you to achieve flexibility, allows you to power scalability, it supports configuration. You know, in terms of, you know, key capabilities that are enabled, it's like customer experience, the digital strategy, analytics, you know, cloud services, um, speed to market and ability to do all that. Um, so, you know, in terms of, um, you know, digital transformation in terms of what's going on. I mean, what are the drivers? Global competition, margin pressures, M&A, demographics, you know, and, and having a digital strategy which, you know, uses a lot of different technologies, focuses on your customer, um, has insights and analytics. To do all this stuff, that's where ERP fits in as the foundation overall. Um, it's a good baseline, for, as I said, for digital strategy going forward. Um, you know, here's a good here's a good example. Eight ways your ERP can lead your digital transformation. You know, implement in phases, but also you know, implement rewrite the right business processes. Oh, ERP sorry. can be can be used to drive your business process. Maximize the value of your data. Have ERP be customer centric. Be your cloud path to the cloud. As I'm saying, all these in all these situations, you got to get to the cloud. Training, you know, and be in the digital foundation. Overall, so I mean, the ERP is, is is absolutely foundational to any type of digital transformation strategy. Um, you know, and here, where's where's the one I'm looking for? You know, here's some here's some definitions of digital transformation. You know, achieving next levels of cu customer intimacy and insights. You know, what are some of the bets that you've got? You know, AI, machine learning, big data analytics, process transformation. You do clouds, application, pro process modernization, RPA, integrated applications, all this stuff around integrated applications, cloud migrations, application transformation. All that stuff can be achieved through using an ERP-based package and an ERP solution. So <clears throat> whenever you're building out, when, so the, the message here is whenever you're building out your, um, your digital strategy, you need to make sure that, um, you know, that, that, that the, the, the in figuring out how ERP fits into that overall picture. All right. So do you guys want to talk about implementation, how you would implement one of these just quickly? Because I have a light touch on that. Actually, John, I have a, a yeah. question. It's not about implementation. It, it's back on slide seven. I'm curious because implementation depends upon people being able to use the platform. On, on slide, uh, actually, let me come back here. Yeah, slide number 24. You said 65% of system integrators and resellers will be unable to train their teams on the product. Yeah, there's a, there's, that's from uh, Gartner. Where, <laughs> so, yeah. okay. This is the ERP product that, that they won't be able to train their teams on. Uh, yeah. That, I mean, here's, 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 <laughs> so how do we implement if we can't you know, even train it? <laughs> 
I mean, it's it's something that I've always seen. I, the last company I was in was doing a Salesforce implementation, which was two years overdue. It's not ERP, but it's it's one of these things where you know the training was just a mess from the from the start. And I'm thinking already they're predicting that the, all this is not going to be trainable. So yeah, how do we implement well? How do you how do you if, first of all? I don't necessarily buy the trainable part. Um, I think I think. Um, because I'll be honest with you, there are plenty of vendors out there and suppliers who can do a good job on this. Um, and, and, and I deal with them all the time. And part of what I do with, with my, I mean, FTI, we do, not, we do not implement. Okay, we have integrators who we recommend and we bring them in and they, they manage for us. I mean, we're, I'm managing like Slalom and Capgemini right now on two of my projects. Um, so... So, I mean, there are plenty of people out there who can do this. So, I mean, I, I, that's what they're saying. The reason I brought that point up is because a lot of people are saying, is it still useful professionally for me to have these skills? And the fact is, you know, with the investment that's been made in ERP over the years, I mean, it's like COBOL programming. Why is COBOL programming still there? Because there's trillions of dollars of code out there. And nobody can afford to replace it, right? And why is stuff like ERP out there and stuff like on-prem ERP? They spent a lot of money on this and, you know, pieces like, I mean, I implemented, we did the, the SAP implementation was $800 million was spent on that. Okay. We did one at BMS and Bristol Myers Squibb. That was 700, that, that was 700 million. So, I mean, th that is here to stay. And there's, there's not just the fact that, you know, what's the best package. And, and we talked about Greenfield. A lot of this is because it's legacy. I mean, they've, they've invested so much into this that you really can't get rid of it. Um, so, I mean, so in terms of like, you know, in terms of the ability to train it, I mean, that's what, that's what Gartner says. Do I believe it? I haven't run into it. I have run into some bad SIs, um, but I have not, I've also found some good ones <laughs> who are out there. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, I was going to touch on um, implementation, light touch implementation. We could we could go for days on how to implement this, but you know, a lot of times, you know, for for anybody's an old skill, old school SAP person, you know, SAP implementation methodology, you know, it's the same methodology irrespective of what ERP you use. You have to design it, you build it, you test it, you deploy it. I mean, that's the critical path of these. Um, there's there's more of the sprint based uh, and agile based development that's going on, um, but the critical path is is it's pretty much pretty much a waterfall based um, solution going forward. Um, I mean, this is what they're doing now for S4 HANA. I mean, for for they call it activate is what SAP calls it. Um, you know, start with the model company, run the fit gap analysis, migrate it onboard it and then you know here we go operating and monitoring it which is all about benefits realization and all that um so you know it's again it's the same critical path um methodology they want to do this whole continuous learning along the customer life cycle I and mean, that's all about customer engagement um generally it's I mean, for your big customers big vendors it's always good to bring them into the design process as you go um just think outside the box and not just yourself um so use that to drive innovation and integration across the piece I mean, here's a sample of, you know, project plan. This is the one, actually, the project I'm working on right now. You know, we're doing this whole consolidation of SAP up at the top piece of this. You know, other components that you typically see in a program, you know, financial consolidation. We're doing Hyperion for financial consolidation. Um, we're doing the whole thing around configuration for, um, you know, gap, gap fit analysis, and we're integrating with Salesforce.com. We have all this other integration that we need to do for third-party applications like document management systems, billing systems that we're using. Um, operational reporting, we're doing a whole data map. We're having a whole data lake. We're building out a data lake um, using Snowflake and we're using, um, uh, using Azure technology to support that. Um, building out the whole, you are gonna do a whole integration testing, UAT integration across the application. Um, and then we've got the whole thing about cutover support where there's post go live support. Another key work stream is the whole OCM organizational change management, critically important um, because of the fact that, you know, a lot of companies, um, 
you know, adoption and getting the companies to adopt the new process is, is absolutely the, the, the key for success. So, you know, when you're building them, get your business engaged, but also, you know, get your OCM piece in here. And then security controls and compliance. That is absolutely critical. Um, I mean, we are seeing tremendous numbers of identity theft, people trying to hack in, security breaches, network breaches. Um, <clears throat> it is absolutely critical that people do their scans, they get their PCI scans done. You know, third parties that are that like Portivity, for example, you know, they, they go out there and they can do these scans and penetration test it, you know, making sure that you actually are certified and, and um, are, are in case. I mean, the whole idea of a chief information security officer, the CISO role, is becoming critical. Every board of directors are asking about them. C, um, CEOs are asking about them um, because it's a major threat and a risk to stock price. Um, so, so in terms of CISO, that's that's a tremendous um, focus, a point of emphasis that companies are are making these days. Um, OCM again, I, I think it's really hard to overstate the importance of of organizational change management <clears throat> because you know making sure that the business and the processes are aligned with the overall um, system that's being implemented is 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 critically important. Um, key steps including awareness, understanding, buy-in, and confidence measure and drive adoption. I mean, these are all pieces that, um, you know, are, 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 you know, critically important to do this and understanding the stakes, get your stakeholders engaged, understand the change and make sure that you're, you're working collaboratively with them to implement this. Yeah, this is, um, let's talk about this here. I mean, one of the, one of the, things that I do a lot of is, is the whole idea of system selection and ERP selection. You know, we talked about, you know, multiple technical platforms that are out there. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I'm, we're brought in to say, okay, which package should I use and who, which systems integrator should we use to implement it? Um, so a lot of the times we have where, I mean, how do we do it? What's a typical approach? You know, let's look at the current state, understand what they have currently. And that's really understanding, you know, what the what is going to be repeated for the future state. It's really, you know, let's <clears throat> let's understand what how this is going to fit into it. Then we have an RFP, draft re request for proposal, um, which will go out to the vendors. Um, so they'll have, you know, we, we're going to get we're going to facilitate the RFP process. We'll have an evaluation scorecards. Um, we'll have the vendor come on site and do demos, um, and that's just for the technology. If you're talking an integrator where you're actually getting the services based thing, key thing is make sure you meet the team. Um, one of the things I see all the time is this, the integrator brings these guys, brings a team on who's, who presents, and then the team that actually shows up the next day is different. Um, when you're making a selection for an integrator, you're hiring the people who show up. So make sure that you, you, you have that opportunity to interview and, and ensure that the team that they're presenting, those are going to be the folks who show up. And then after we go ahead, we just implement the system selection and how long it takes. As, as I told you, the fastest we ever did this, we did it last June. I remember it was crazy. From beginning, we drafted the RFP the first week of June, and we had boots on the ground um, by the fourth week of June. Um, so it is possible to do it very fast, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, in terms of phases, you know, what are some of the ones that we have here? You know, figure out what the footprints will be come up with the BRD, what the business requirements are we need to support, you know, and that's how we're going to, you know, map it up against the particular technology. Um, and you'd also want to do that for the, for the systems integrator to make sure they have the skills and capabilities to deliver and implement the solution that, that you're, that you're focusing on. Um, for the second one, system or system, the process, you know, let's get the RFPs, who are the vendors we're dealing with um, for the particular piece. I um, mean, this case was largely HR. So, was the HCM, so we, you know, these are some of the vendors we looked at in this particular. Let's do the custom scorecard and, and validate these things. And then for phase three, you know, example scoring, we would look at the experience, capabilities, approach, you know, what are the options, score them out. And then based on that, we'll make a recommendation to the overall customer, and then they will select the vendor. Um, and this question was asked earlier. I mean, let's, <clears throat> let's talk about, you know, how do these typically land? You know, and a lot of times for, you know, what are the typical ERP for mid-market companies? Financial services, NetSuite, and Sage Intact. I've done a lot of NetSuite. Real estate, Yardi, because that's a proprietary property management. But you got Oracle, J.D. Edwards. I'm not a big fan of J.D.E. 
um, just because, I've, I've, as I said, I've never seen it installed. I've seen it pulled out. Um, and then additional modules like asset management may be required, wholesale distribution, NetSuite, retail, NetSuite. Manufacturing uh, dynamics is good for that. Um, Epicor, and if there's Plex, I mean, some of the Plex systems can be specific. Um, you'll find in manufacturing, there's a, there's a plethora of custom, of, of, of spe industry-specific uh, based applications. For complex manufacturing, that's where you go with SAP or, or one of the big ones. You, are, you go with um, Oracle, eBusiness e Suite, or go with SAP um, ERP. Dynamics AX can do it, but it's not as strong as the, as the SAP side of it. Transportation, Dynamics, and then for healthcare, you know, uh, Cloud ERP, Infor. I've used SAP in, cloud, in healthcare as well. Um, but those are typically what are the applications that could go into those different ones. We are at 10.27 right now. Is there anything, does anyone have any questions at this point? I think I covered everything. Uh, yeah, I think just a quick question. So does that mean that enterprises have to go for different ERPs for uh, different uh, uh, operations like finance go with SAP and you know, stuff like that? So same organization using different uh, ERPs? No, you don't. You want to use one. You want to use one. Um, because, I mean, the, the fact is that the skills required to operate or even if it's just a business analyst type thing, they're different skills. So from an organizational perspective, it's hard to, to maintain multiple systems. Um, I mean, I've dealt with that. Usually when you have yeah. the multiple, multiple ERPs, it's usually one of those growth through acquisition type scenarios where, you know, two companies merge and you've got, and the first thing they're going to want to do is get on one platform. Because first of all, there's, there's reporting, I mean, for financial consolidation, for supply chain optimization, for business processes, you know, consolidating and, and leveraging your spend from a procurement perspective, you know, one face to the customer instead of having, you know, multiple bills and having on the front end, you want to keep, keep that. Uh, so you want to consolidate it down, but Jeff, Jeff, definitely. Want to have slide you presented, uh, you will also have like uh, requirements of the company, the size, et cetera, and then suggest, which ERP they should go with, is it? Yeah, I mean, the one I just presented here was, uh, which slide was it here? Oh, that one right there. Yeah, I mean, this is a mid-market. This would be, you know, I don't know, $500 million in sales, you know, $200 million. I mean, I'm saying, I mean, the thing is, I, I did NetSuite and we, we implemented that the last summer it was about 350K to do it, 350 grand for integrator costs and then the licensing. So it's not, it's not that horribly expensive and you can do it pretty quick. And I guarantee you, I mean, we, we were talking about custom packages and containerized solutions, you know, doing something like this in the cloud. I mean, because the beautiful thing about the cloud is you don't have to own a data center, don't have to deal with infrastructure, you know, the cloud takes care of all that stuff for you. So. You can focus your energy. I mean, the thing, the thing that that kind of thing does, which is good, is, you know, this new company that I stood up, you know, their, their IT group is now focused on their data lake, on analytics. They're focused on IoT and, and customer experience. They're focused on, you know, all these things that they can do to drive new, new types of business. So they're not working, they're not focused on stuff like how do I run a data center? They're focused on stuff that drives revenue and drives EBITDA, which is what, you know, a company should be focused on. Okay. I, I have question? another question, John. Sure. Um, on your slide for ease of use, slide 23, you, you rate most of the platforms basically the same. Um, is it really the case for the end user? Because, I mean, who uses that platform 90% of the time or just the employees, not the IT team? So good data comes from easy platforms. Are they all really about uh, the same or no? Probably the not. End user, like day -to -day, if I was going to score these, yeah. if I was going to score these, I would say too. Okay. I think both of these, frankly, Kind of heavy. The way to describe it is a heavy application. I don't know if you've yeah. ever seen a, an SAP screen, but they're yes. they're not as intuitive as as you might find. 
NetSuite Not on close. the other hand is pretty straightforward. I mean, nice and nice and intuitive. Um, uh, Dynamics 365 is also intuitive. As a, and again, when you're looking at Dynamics, the thing to think about is that Office 365 integration. You know, because I mean, and that's a major sell for that because, you know, the the thing about remember I was talking about analytics and data and all that. Mm-hmm. You're on the cloud at that point. So I mean, in terms of like verifications that you have on the front end, Active Directory, all the security stuff is there. But this common data module, this is this is you know core to to, to our Microsoft strategy. You can do all kinds of analytics in here, and we talked about in, Industry 4.0. You've got Azure here to support all that stuff, so all this stuff can hang together. So I mean, the Microsoft stack is quite good. They've done a really great job. Yeah, I just I, that's that's always what I look at is will the people actually do what they're supposed to in the system? So. Yeah, I mean, and 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 that's the whole thing when you're implementing these things. And I and I say this all the time is that you know people don't want to know about methodology. They don't want to know about all the rest of it. What they want to know about is, um, you know, they just want to be, you know, tell me what you need me to do. <laughs> can I do my job? Yeah, and they should my, be. Is it easier to do my job or harder now? Yeah. <laughs> but they're not so. tech, they're not technologists, nor should they be. No. Um, but the tool that and the technology's job is to help them do their job, but also you know, let them gain the insights they need from their job to, to grow their business, right? Um, I mean, we, we, we've done ones where, where, you know, one face of the customer, you know, leveraging products across lines of business. I mean, all those kinds of things open up new doors. Right. I mean, the, the business, I, the one I stood up last, last summer with the stood up the data lake, I mean, their business was very transactional, like they would help them with something and then they would stop and then they would do it again and then they would help them. Their goal was is to have more of an ongoing business relationship, you know, and they use things like data and analytics to do that, but that's helping their, their business people do that kind of thing. And that's through, you know, a lot of the data that's, that's provided here and provided the tools they can to, to achieve that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. John, thank you for a great presentation. Um, okay, well. We'll try to get you back again. Well, what would be something else you'd want to talk about? We could talk about ERP implementations or we could talk, I mean, that's a good question. Is what kind of subject would you want to talk about? But well, we could talk about that somewhere else. Yeah, we encourage people to let us know what kind of topics they would like to have covered. Um, Martin posted um, the code for the Menti survey. So if everyone will take a look at the chat box and you can use your cell phone or your laptop and go to menti.com and the code is 239-864. Yeah, this is Pat. I didn't mean to um, confuse people, but uh, you should do the Menti one. I just posted a quick survey as well uh, so I could get a gauge on a few things that um, I'm working on. But thank you for doing both. We appreciate that and for coming. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
So the, the ERP implementation is the topic people are interested. Martin, uh -huh. I'm here. I can, I can share uh, the chat log uh, as well as the results of the poll I did. I, I mean, selfishly, I wanted to make sure I could make the poll work, you know, for the dinner meeting. Uh -huh. Sure. But, um, because I screwed up on the lunch and learn one yesterday and realized yeah. it was end polling, so I didn't get any results. <laughs> But um, I did one today, so I will uh, okay. share that with you as well. And yeah, you can share it with all four of us. Oh, of course. Yeah, I will. N yeah. No worries. I say Mark, yeah, yeah. like the collective group. Yeah, the chat log would be nice, too. Yeah, um, we got, um, we had a lot of good um uh, good feedback on Lunch and Learn yesterday in that chat log. And from what I can see, here uh, on both of the um, on both the poll and on the chat log, people were saying they enjoyed the presentation. So, Pat, uh, the poll. How? So you just click on yes or no to vote. Yeah. You mean on the poll? Yeah. How? Oh. Do you interact. You do it with? or? So that's why I tried to oh. figure out. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I don't know. Since you're a co-host, I don't know if you saw it because uh, no, I don't. I don't think it just popped up and it just popped up and then went off. Yeah. 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 And so, like, we because have... seeing yes. the results. Did you see, you didn't see any results though, No, did you? we're seeing, I'm seeing the results, but not the, not the poll itself. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. So we had, uh, there's uh, 15 people answered. Did you find the speaker interesting? And 93% yes, 13% it's okay. Uh, did you f like the virtual meeting format? Yes was okay, 93 and, oh, can you see the screen in a minute? Yeah, I can see the result actually. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And then for, I, okay. you see, I wanted to ask this question at the end uh, because, you know, we don't have the, uh, you know, in-person one anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was just wondering about, uh, if people would pay a fee, uh, mm -hmm. a small Fort Worth charges one. A lot of the, a lot of the chapters do, but many don't. You know, so. so I was just curious if uh, what the appetite for that was, so to speak. <laughs> so it looks like there's thirty three percent yes, seven percent no, and sixty seven percent maybe. Um, I have, uh, we have over 230 people for the dinner meeting. Wow. So uh, that's quite a few. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. Yeah, I think the number 10, we pay a small fee. And mm -hmm. there are more people than maybe 67% than maybe. Yeah. Um, so now, um, maybe you should have left it up longer mm -hmm. uh, because, um, yeah, maybe I should have left it up longer. Oh, yeah. It's really 18. It's good to have 30. Good, yeah. By the way, I do record this. Uh, I didn't start from the beginning, Sorry. but I do record uh, this section in the... Well, that's good. Judge, but yeah, so we can, I don't know how big is the file, but it's, it's, I said that to my laptop. So uh, let me see how big it is, and maybe we can, you know, show Maybe that. you can just post it someplace. Yes. You could maybe post it on, um, 
in my Dallas, and then that way people who didn't see see or you know who weren't here can uh, actually yeah. listen. Yeah, so I think some of the lessons learned are we should we should record unless the uh, speaker mm -hmm. backs to it. Mm -hmm. um, we should uh, we need to do polling of some sort. You know, the I probably should have done uh, done the Menti one yesterday. We never did that though for uh, for our lunch and learn. We never did, but yeah, we got to try this one out. And uh, I think maybe we uh, participants should be told that uh, they have to take a moment to take the poll uh, because what happened was the speaker was talking and uh, in between yeah. the pop up came and it just went off. We didn't know whether it'll wait, so we can yeah. see the talk. That's a very so good suggestion. Thank you. <laughs> I I agree. Okay. okay so that, that's, so I also, start. I suppose we should. Oh, and I'm also sorry. In the other uh, poll, it is still asking whether the food was good and uh, ambience, room temperature, things like that. Oh Which, yeah, you have to adjust that. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. But that's a good idea to tell people there's a poll up there if you want to answer it. That that's a good idea. Yeah. So um, also. Um, you can register people through Zoom and uh, not so much register, but before they come in the door, they have to answer a couple of questions. And then that lets you get a lot of other reports afterwards, like how long they were here and when they came and when they left and, and all of that. So I'm still fooling around with reports, but uh, uh, there's a lot. There's lots of information in this tool. You just have to learn how to use it. But I interrupted you, Martin. I'm sorry. No, no problem. And I just say no. I, I still recording now, but that's fine. So at least you know all the conversation here. We can you know, just a recap, so we can get together and we do a license that. Did I provide a code for the breakfast meeting for uh, the PDUs? If not, I'll go out and do it um, so that you have one. Do you have a code for the lunch and learn too? Um, no, I, I didn't because typically that's self-reporting. But I mean, I can create one. I may have one. I don't know. I, You know, the last couple of days I've done so many of these different things, but so quickly and sometimes multitasking, I have to go back and check. And PMI.org was being, uh, you know, worked on, had maintenance. So it was down yesterday when I was thinking about it. So um, I'll go out and take a look. And, you know, whatever I find out, I'll send, send you the codes, you know. So okay. I can do that. Yeah. And also, uh, Pat, you know, usually when people reach the event, they can say, okay, I want to automatically uh, get the PPU. Uh, I think there's a person in the chapter, you know, that person will help to submit uh, the PDO request to PMI. And, and sometimes we get an email back from the PMI and say, okay, you know, uh, your PD, PD get approved, I guess submit and approve. You usually you get two emails. One is a submission right. and it's an approved email. So right. I don't know if we have the same same person doing the same for the virtual meeting as well. We should, right? So maybe you can uh, remind, maybe make sure that person is still doing the, the PDU submission. I don't know. Who, I don't know who does that. Is it does? Is Pranab doing it? No. He's, uh, someone, he's someone just else. making sure everybody was here. Correct. Yeah. Pranab, yeah. Pranab, yeah. Pranab, Pranab, did you get everybody noted? Right. Uh, 